Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 22. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cash Flow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. And I am glad that you are here. Today, we're going to do something that I know, or at least that you have told me that you like. We're going to do some more live segments from some of the other places that I've been this particular year. Uh, so we're going to take a little trip back in time, so to speak, and take you live to some of the places that I've been. In this particular case, we're going to go over to Sacramento, and you're going to hear you know, a couple segments of some live interaction that I think will be very, very beneficial to you. If this is the first time that you've joined us on the Cashflow Diary podcast, feel free to go back to episode one to understand a little bit about the background of the show, who I am, etc., uh, because uh, it may be of benefit to you to understand why you would want to listen or who I am and what's going on. And more importantly, hopefully you, you know, learn something. And speaking of learning something, uh, make sure you go over to learninvestingnow.com. Again, learninvestingnow.com. Place your name and email in the box and receive your free e-course that will teach you how to do real estate using none of your own money or credit as a wholesaler. That's how I started in the real estate game, and now I'm endeavoring to let you do the same thing using the same technique, same worksheet, same everything, so that you can go out there and earn some cash and make it happen. Uh, for those of you uh, who have joined us before, you know that I love to start the episode with what we call our cash quote, and here it is for this episode. One can choose to go back towards safety or forward towards growth. Growth must be chosen again and again. Fear must be overcome again and again. Uh, that quote comes to us from none other than Mr. Abraham Maslow. You may be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, he was an American psychologist who was best known for, again, creating the Maslow hierarchy of needs. It's just simply a theory of psychological health uh, predicated on fulfilling innate human needs in priority culminating in self-actualization. Now, if those words, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with it, you probably should look it up because it makes a lot of sense uh, when you begin to understand it. But one of the things that was unique about Maslow, especially during his time, he stressed the importance of focusing on the positive qualities in people as opposed to treating them like a big bag of symptoms. <laughs> now, let's let's think about that for a second. How often are you and I and all of us just focused on what we're afraid of versus what we can choose? I love the fact that he used the word growth must be chosen again and again because growth doesn't just happen by accident. It, it, it is an intentional uh, result of a choice that you and I make uh, continually. And one of the things that I wanted to share with you is specifically in this particular first segment is what that could sound like as it goes through your own head. You'll hear me uh, speak with a one of the participants uh, at the event, and you, you can hear my thought process regarding a recent acquisition, and it, it may help you, you know, uh, hopefully it does for you to hear some of the things that go through my head uh, as it comes down to acquiring more and more and, well, more <laughs> real estate. So here we go. In real estate investing, to or started thinking about real estate investing, was multifamily your focus at that time? No, <laughs> and yes. When I start thinking about something, I do what Stephen Covey says right? You begin with the end in mind. In mind. It doesn't say that that's where you begin with the end in action. 
okay? It's the end is what I cared about first. I knew ultimately, right now I wish I, I know the, I, I have, still have this book, my dream book I still have, and in it is what I thought was the end. <laughs> I thought the end was $10,000 of passive income a month uh, derived from a bunch of single family houses. That's what I thought the end was. So I was working towards that end. Uh, because at that time, I thought $10,000 a month of passive income was actually a difficult challenge and would take me decades to do. I was clearly wrong. And you need to be open to surprising yourself to that what you currently consider being the end may not actually be the end. It could very well be the beginning, <laughs> okay? And allowing whatever it is that you're trying to go get to morph and change, because as I've grown and changed, what I want to do has grown and also changed, not only in size and scope, but just in, in content uh, in and of itself. So uh, multifamily is what I saw myself being able to own multiple units, uh, mostly because that's how I grew up. It's what made the most sense. It was easier for me to understand the inner workings of an apartment building than it is a single family house. Because until, yeah, until now, I had never lived in a single family house, ever, my entire life. So I didn't know, I mean, if you can go back and check my Facebook, you can see the date I learned how to light a pilot. Because I was so excited that I didn't blow up. I decided to make a Facebook status out of it. <laughs> because I'm like, sweet, I just lit my first pilot light. Because you, you, you didn't have to really do that type of stuff before. So I'm just more familiar with it. And it makes it easy. If I'm familiar with it, it makes it easy. It's like right now, uh, many of you know that I'm in escrow on a 182 unit build. There's a new trick to this one. Why? The new trick is that it comes, and first of all, I'm buying it with tenants in there. But the new trick is that it comes with, come on in, it comes with new, uh, it comes with employees already. There's internal staff, which is an additional risk, which I don't really like. But anyway, I got to deal with it. And <laughs> it's new for me. I don't like it. However, uh, it's obviously it's forcing me to grow. And you can't do hundreds of units without on-site people. It's just, just if you're going to do large apartment buildings, know that you will have managers and maintenance on site. The question becomes, how many? And the previous owner, for whatever reason, he's hired and, and pays three maintenance people and one property manager. And I'm just looking at the numbers, and at the end of the day, one of the maintenance people has to go. It's one thing to fire a person because they messed up. It's one thing to not rehire a contractor. It's another to change property managers because this guy messed up. But there's nothing that the person who is, this is about to impact did wrong at all. And I got to pick who to let go. And she, right. She's like, she's trying to help me out. Can he go to another building? Anything. I know, right? And that's exactly what my CFO said. He's like, you know, maybe there's another property we can put them on. And then, then it came to me. It was like, I have a 70-unit building that doesn't have an in-house maintenance person yet. So if he's good enough, then yes, we'll send him over there. But the likelihood is, is that he'll be gone, right? That's a new thing to deal with. There's always going to be something new. There's always going to be something that's outside the comfort zone. And you've got to let it grow till it becomes comfortable. There's going to come a day when... Uh, it doesn't bother me as much to, unfortunately or fortunately, let people go strictly based upon the numbers. There's going to come that day. Fortunately, in this case, my wife uh, was previously a recruiter, right? So <laughs> I go to her for advice. I'm like, honey, I got to fire a person. And I'm like, what, what happened the first time you had to fire a person? And this is not the response you should ever give someone when they're nervous about doing this for the first time. She goes, oh my God, that took forever and I hate it. I'm like, thanks, honey. You are reassuring me right now. I feel so confident. This is going to be easy. Uh, right. <laughs> She's like, the first one, it took like 45 minutes for me to even get the words. I'm just like, oh, this, this is not what I want to hear. So then I, you know, 
I, I'm also asking my CFO. Now, she's more like me. She's very direct, straight to the point. I love it. So I'm sitting here going, okay, so what happened the first time you had to fire? She goes, oh, I threw up. <laughs> I was like, great. This is not shaping up to be the experience I want it to be. But I'm open to growing, and you, you have to be too. When you first start, you're going to begin with a certain end, but as you go and grow through this process, it should change because you're going to change. You're going to see things are going to begin to look different to you. To me, today, a 50-unit building is easier than a single-family house. That probably tweaked some of your thinking, but that's good. A 50-unit building is easier than a single-family house, period, for me. You be open to the growth. Be open to change because you don't know what's going to happen. You may find out that, you know, you're really good at storage units. You just may find that out, and it may not be intentional that you find it out, but if you find that out, then you need to go in that direction and be open to becoming that person. Like, there's, oh, I love her in so many ways. Because the first time I came here, but again, that was the whole concept of the investor identity class, is to give you an idea of where you should go so you could begin to form an end and see what happens and unfolds as you go. Because more, what's most important is that you develop some sort of end and get started towards it. Your path to the end you think you're going to end up at, it, one, the end is going to change and the path is going to be very fluid. <laughs> you need to be open to what, whatever feedback you get as you start on this process. Same like with Candace. First time I saw her uh, and we were going through the concept of investor identity, I was like, hey, here's a neat idea. You might want to try it. You have this built-in network of people and you understand the needs uh, for special needs children and all this other stuff. Develop housing specifically for that. I don't understand it, but you do. That was your gift. And I bet you there are a whole lot of other people who have the same irritating problems with real estate. And they're a captive audience because no one is trying to serve them. It's still real estate, but because you specialize in this, I bet you can charge more. You can get more for the house. You can get more for rent. You can do all kinds of things simple because they can't get it anywhere else. And lo and behold, she's like, yeah, that's a great idea. And she actually went and did that, which is good. <laughs> Each one of us has something like that inside of us that we can go and express inside the real estate game. But you've got to take the time to figure out what that end looks like. So I primarily do apartment buildings because I, I, I know what it's like to walk upstairs to go home. <laughs> that makes sense. I did it all my life. I know what that means. That's, I mean, and it helps me to serve that customer. And that's the customer because of how I grew up, where I grew up, all these other things makes it very easy for me to serve them. Welcome back. And one of the things you probably heard me mention more than once is serving a particular customer. And that's something that uh, I definitely like to think about when it comes to real estate, whether that be buy and hold, fix and flip, lease option. It doesn't really matter what strategy you're using. The point is, is it's a basic business principle to think about the needs of your customer. And for those of you that are you know, just getting started in real estate, what I was referring to in terms of investor identity has to do with who you are and more importantly, uh, so many different characteristics of who you are. And one of the most important things that I've seen and learned uh, from other investors, myself included, is that typically we have the best chance of success serving a customer that's most like us simply because we know us the best uh, at the beginning. Now, that doesn't mean that you stay serving the same type of customer. It just means that it's a good place to start because when you don't have a frame of reference, one of the most important things you can do is go out there and get some feedback from the marketplace to understand, you know, am I capable? How can I better serve the customer that I'm looking to serve. And without that feedback, you you know, you're only guessing. And it, it's usually best to start with, you know, the person you know, like you. So uh, with that, that, that's kind of, you know, the first segment. We're going to take a break here for a second and get over to our 
cash flow question. Now, remember, those of you uh, answering the question, you have the ability to email and or call in. The phone number is 800-689-1764. Again, that's 800-689-1764. And you can call in the answer to the question, or you can email it in to cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. So let's talk about last week's question. Hi, I'm calling to answer the cash flow question of the week. Um, and the question was, when uh, when you're investing, do you actually earn your money? And the answer is on the buy, when you buy the property. Um, so when you submit the offer and uh, they, they accept it, if it, the price is right, that's when you earn it on the buy. Excellent and well done. Uh, Jenna, you, of course, are the one who wins the prize for this week. And for those of you who don't know, uh, basically what the prize is, it's a copy of my book that is soon to be released, Jay Massey's Cash Flow Creation System, How to Create Wealth in Any Economy. And we've been pre-selling it for a while, and it's been awesome to see uh, those things come in. And for those of you who want a free autograph copy, you've got to answer the cash flow question. So let's talk about this week's question. During the sales process, when you are talking to a seller, when you're negotiating equity or debt or private capital or whatever it is that you're doing, you are using various skills. So here's what I want to know. During the skill sales process, what's the most important skill that you're using? It's often a skill that many of us have to learn to develop. And here's a hint. If you listen to the next live segment, I'll talk about it. And just as a quick side note, um, I know uh, that the audio quality is different uh, between the ones that you know, you're know you hearing right now and the live segments, understand it's live. Also something to be aware of, if you haven't listened to the first episode, you may not know that I actually have uh, asthma and occasionally when speaking, I get a little excited and sometimes winded, blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending, uh, on this next segment, you can really, really hear the fact that I was having trouble breathing, but the show must go on as they say. And so just be nice to me on the reviews. We're doing the best we can to clean it up, et cetera, et cetera. But just understand, I wanted to make sure we got the content to you. So don't talk about the reading. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Occasionally, however, I will also add features that make it more convenient for the uh, apartment person. For example, this happens whether it's apartment or single family house. It's just easier to do because it's an apartment um, because I have volume. I can go to the cable company and say, hey, this entire building, I will devote to you, your cable company, and pre-wire my building for your cable company. Here's what I want. I want that $65 package. I want it at $15. And I want a percentage of the revenue. Do we have a deal? That's that. And now, I take what the tenant would have had to pay $65 for. I actually charge them $30. I make $15. They got a $35 discount, and I get a percentage of the rep. Does that make sense? So all of those things begin to be additional income streams, which, again, solve the tenant's problem. But it also solves my problem, because I can't stand it when the incompetent, usually incompetent cable guy comes and busts up my wall or my building to try to install a satellite dish or the cable. Make sense? So it's really a property preservation move. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to protect my property. I just turned it into an income stream. Make sense? So it's stuff like that that we take the extra time to talk about. You've heard me uh, mention when I'm working a building, I'm not done with it until we do three things at a minimum. And there are five you could do total. Four and five... I'm just not worried about numbers four and five. So there's found, forced, phased, and then there's inflated and passive. So when someone says the word equity to me, 
I'm thinking one of these five things. Three of them I have control over, two of them I do not, period. I have control over the first three. I don't have control over inflated or passive appreciation, increase in price. I don't have control over inflated appreciation because I, I don't control the switch that prints more money, period. I don't have control over passive because I can't control someone's irresistible urge to suddenly pay more for the same piece of real estate. I, I can't control that. I can influence that. And in fact, especially in single family houses, that's what you are trying to do. You are primarily focusing on forcing them to want to pay more just because it's got bushes in the front yard. <laughs> Honey, it's got the bushes that we had when we got married, so it's worth more. Okay, that's fine if that's your business model. I'm just saying it's not what I focus on. I focus on these, okay? So what does that mean? I try to find appreciation. That means I buy properties at a steep discount. Whatever that means to you, it means a certain thing to me. Uh, I look for stuff at a discount, all right? Um, and that's what you do when you find it. The finding of it is in your negotiations up front. A lot of the negotiations is done with listening, <laughs> right? So, and that's the point why listening is a very, very important skill that we talked about earlier. The forced appreciation is what you did to the property to make it worth more. What did you do? Did you add cable? Did you uh, put in a different, like right now, one of the things that we're doing in, well, in any building that we're now rehabbing, we're changing our flooring plan because, well, we're still doing concrete first floor on some of them, but we're also changing it to, I'm going to try to get the word right. She called it some sort of a epoxy. My uh, operations officer is more from Northern California, so she's always in my ear about green and healthy and this stuff. I'm just like, okay, <laughs> give me what? <laughs> and she's found some sort of flooring material. It costs a little bit more, but uh, we shouldn't have to replace it, and we should never have to paint it again. So I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> that I'll do. I will gladly do that. So we're putting that in, and it's got something low VOCs. That means something to some of you. Okay, great. It means nothing to me other than low operating expense. So right, that's all I cared about, and no lawsuit. It, right. That, 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 those are the two things. No lawsuit, low operating expense, go ahead. And then the rest, she's all fired up about. But because of you know, those types of floorings, that's going to uh, decrease our turnover expense. See, I plan for turnover w during the rehab because I know I'm going, to, I'm going to have it. So therefore, I change the flooring, I change the paint. We change what we use so that to turn over a unit, it's literally hire two maids, wipe stuff down, and leave. <laughs> no paint, no new carpet, none of that. And we can turn over a unit in a few hours, and then it's ready to lease again because my inventory is time. And if I don't have any units for people to occupy that time, that's a problem. I can't have down units, so I've got to think about that stuff ahead of time, right? All of those things go into forced appreciation. How do you operate and make the property worth more? How do you make it shine? So one way to do this is to also think about your tenant. A lot of my tenants are single parents uh, or at least have one child, if not two. And one of the things that this city likes to do is they want to make sure that there are more clean, safe, affordable places for the kids to play. So there's a, it's possible to get playgrounds donated if you have the requisite space. In the 182-unit building that uh, we have, that we're in escrow in right now, there's actually two playgrounds, but there are no kids using it, which says to me that, hmm, still wasn't the highest and best use of that real estate. At this moment, I don't know what we're going to do with that, but I do know this. The city has a dire need for daycare. <laughs> So uh, one of the, okay, so the 182 units is almost on seven acres. There's about a whole acre that is just green space. And I'm just like, man, that's lawn maintenance. <laughs> that's all I see when I look at it. So I'm like, how, what can we turn that into to actually turn it into revenue? And I think, we can, I think that's going to be enough space with setbacks and parking to be able to actually put a daycare there, which would be great which really changes that, and it meets the need of the tenant. Make sense? So all of those things are things that, yeah, I'll do stuff like that, but that is phased appreciation. Once you've made it functional and maybe a little bit prettier, the next thing is what can I add to the building to make it worth even more? What service can I add to make it completely out of the ordinary 
that someone else hasn't seen before. Another way to phase appreciation that I definitely espouse and like is you don't just buy one building on, or one house, buy the entire street. On the, I mean, you were happy with one, might as well be happy with 10, right? <laughs> buy them all. Because, thank you. Because the first one you buy benefits from the 10th one you bought. Even more so because you have control over all 10. Because one of the greatest dangers that you have as a buy and hold investor is who buys the property next door. And you, because you got no control, you don't know what, the, you don't know what, who they're listening to, you don't know how late they stayed up one night and how many 1995s they spent to learn to do whatever it is that they're doing and they're trying to do it on a nickel when they should be spending at least a quarter and then they'll put the first person in there who causes problems and then your tenant leaves because the person next door isn't the person they want to live next to. And that's a problem. That's why you want to buy the street. That's another reason I like apartment buildings because I got control of a lot right there. Boom, it's me, it's me. And, and in fact, in my opinion, one of the best things to do is to buy all the single family houses around an apartment building I control. Because that's what you're concerned about, especially if you're buying single family houses. Who's going to buy that apartment building? Because that, as that apartment building goes, so does that zip code. <laughs> it's just woo, and it can go down fast. And you're like, what do I do? I'm stuck with this house that nobody else now wants because of the apartment building. So if I'm going to put something in in a building, I may not be able to charge more for it, but it should make my tenant want to stay longer. If I can get even one extra month, so if I go from tenant staying 14 months to 15 months, that's one extra month of consistent revenue without experiencing the turnover expense. All right, so if you've been playing along, you probably heard the skill set that I was referring to. And just as a reminder, for those of you that are uh, after a free autographed copy of the book, feel free to call in your answer at 800-689-1764 or email it in uh, to cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. If you send in an email and or call, make sure that you give us the address. It's kind of hard to send the book through the email. Anyway, from that last section, you probably heard some different ideas as it relates to appreciation or phased appreciation, etc. And some of the things that you know you can consider when you're going to take down a property, how to change it, how to customize it, how to make it produce the most revenue it possibly can Per square foot, you know, use every inch of the square footage that you're being, you know, entrusted with. So you're, you're purchasing, you know, maybe, you know, two acres, a half acre, three quarters of an acre. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is you, that's your acreage. That's your opportunity to serve your customer the best and, and look for those ways that you can do so. Understand your customer and you will be able to understand your particular marketplace and more importantly, dominate it. In such a way that, you know, you won't really, quote unquote, have competition. And it, it puts you in a completely unique space when it comes to the whole real estate arena. So hopefully uh, you've been able to enjoy this particular episode. And, you know, this is what I want to leave you with. Understand this. Every one of your deals uh, should solve problems. Hopefully it will. And as you begin to understand the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those are the types of problems that you're looking to solve. Until next time. Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cashflow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.